this term, the theme for ice science was other worlds. So who better to talk to than a real life astronaut who celebrated the 25th anniversary of her space mission here at the Science Museum, where her suit is still housed. I'm talking, of course, about the legendary Helen Sharman, who was the very first British person in space. When you were up there in the space station and you looked back, you could presumably see kind of Earth from space. What was that like? Was that just amazing and surreal? It or? is. It's the most beautiful view. Um, every astronaut just loves to look out of the window. And from low Earth orbit, you know, 400 kilometres away, we can see that the Earth is curved, but you can't see the whole of the Earth in one, doesn't it? It's a globe like you do from the moon, something yeah. like that. Um, so I could see vast swathes of Europe, for instance, in one go. Um, so yeah, beautiful views. I mean, the, everybody talks about the blue, you know, this gorgeous, deep, deep blue. And for a chemist, you know, we, we know, understand about um, the vibration of the water molecules and they absorb the red end of the spectrum. And that's what makes you know, water appear in mass to be blue. But it is this deep blue, not dark, I mean, but you know, it looks like it goes down a long way. Um, I, the, the most interesting thing, I think, is, um, is the odd effect of humans on Earth. So you don't tend to see, of course, individual humans you can't see. You can see the lights of cities and um, when there's a lot of light in one position. But you see things in straight lines because nature is not straight. So um, anything that's artificial is in these straight lines you can see. So um, condensation trails of aircraft. But if you see the trails sort of crisscrossing all over like this, then you must be over Europe. If you see them doing this, going into one particular part, you could be over um, Asia, or it could be east or west coast of the States. If there's not an awful lot, then you're over the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, it's very, very clear. It's amazing. So when you were off in the space station, what, you had work and experiments to be getting on with. What, what kind of work did you do out there? So my job was doing experiments yeah. on the space station, and although I was disappointed that we ran out of money, essentially, to take a whole load of British experiments up there. But a new agreement was made. So part of the agreement with the Soviet Space Agency was that I flew their experiments. They wanted to show off to the world what variety of stuff they do in space. So I got to do this amazing variety of stuff, um, looking out of the window, measuring the colours of certain points of the Earth so we can, from that, work out the amount of salt that might be present in a particular area of agricultural bacteria in a lake, for instance. Um, I grew protein crystals, luciferase, and um, bring them back to Earth. And the idea is that you can design drugs based on the knowledge that you create from being able to grow crystals bigger and more pure without the dislocations in them than you can grow on Earth. Um, looking at how my body and the other cosmonauts were adapting to spaceflight um, and growing you know, food, really. So looking at agriculture in space, looking at how we can grow potatoes. I and mean, growing seeds is quite interesting because if you put a magnet, a really strong magnetic field on one side of the seeds as they germinate, and the roots grow, instead of sort of growing in all directions as they would normally, feeling weightless, um, they tend to grow towards the magnetic field. That's really interesting for long-term spaceflight. So my spacesuit is really quite fun to be able to have it so close to me, and yet it's so far away. I know it's behind a glass panel these days, but recently, um, for the 25th anniversary of my space launch, we had a load of astronauts over, and we did a lot of media stuff, and the Science Museum brought it out of its case. Um, but I wasn't allowed to touch it, or I you know, had to wear a glove on to do that. So it was quite quite an, an odd experience. But it's um, yeah, it's, it's quite um, it's nice that I think we've got this little bit of me still in the science museum now. It is designed to sit in a sort of in a seat with your your knees sort of bent up and sort of hunched over a bit like that, which is really quite comfortable. But if you then try and stand up straight in it, um, it it's, it's you know it's, it's more more difficult. So it's it's strengthened for this sort of crouch position. So astronauts look as though they're sort of they're carrying the world on their shoulders when they come out as well, um, yeah, after the final press conference to wave goodbye. Does it take like, quite a long time to put on? Or uh, you learn how to put it on, so it okay. takes gradually you get quicker and quicker. Um, but yes, it's not the most easy thing. So it opens up through a large sort of hole really in the stomach area. Putting it on on Earth is is one thing. So we we, we drape it over the back of a chair. So for all the training sessions and the simulators, you. You, know, you slide into it by sitting on the chair. But of course, when you're floating around feeling weightless, it's a totally different scenario because the, the feet are quite heavy and therefore still massive, even though they're weightless. So they tend to have quite a bit of, sort of momentum. If you start push your legs in and they flick to one side, so they tend to flick up the back. So you're trying to put your, your legs in one way and the legs, the sort of the feet of the space suit, 
So it's a bit silly, but it's kind of yeah. It's, a, the, it's not the easiest thing to put on, but um, it does you know it does keep you alive if you lose the air from the spacecraft. What do you think about kind of the Mars missions? Do you think we'll ever be able to grow anything on Mars? Do you think anything will kind of come of what we've learnt so far? Oh, um, I'm sure we will go to Mars and, and relatively soon. So the last Astronauts Congress I attended in October this year, um, so just about a month or so ago, um, we were debating not just you know, if we're going to Mars, um, not even when we're going to Mars, but it's actually we will go to Mars within the next 30 years. We think the first person to walk on the surface of Mars has been born. Um, we think that person is probably at school. We have a couple of big things to sort out. Um, radiation protection is one of the biggest. So if we just go now with the spacesuits that we have right now, um, astronauts will die of cancer, and that's if they last long enough not to go blind with cataracts first as well. Good. So there's a lot of work going on in terms of building um, habitats with the right kind of shielding, spacesuits with the right kind of um, radiation shielding. So yes, yeah, so Matt Damon seemed to sort of you know, be quite <laughs> mobile in his spacesuit, didn't he? And I think it's. Well, it looks unlikely that we're going to be quite that, um, to have, have that freedom of movement, unless we can develop some absolutely amazing um, material. So is anybody out there who's a material scientist? Um, yeah, to, to actually shield us from, um, from the radiation. So yeah, radiation and growing food. So yes, this is the biggie. So we can take seeds into space, um, and we can grow lettuce, um, salad, basil, whatever. Um, um, and we can eat those, you know, those leaves, but what we can't do is, is take a plant into space, sort of get it to flower, and then pollinate that flower, and then have it turn to seed so that we can then replant it, or create the fruit even better, of course. You want to have fruit and vegetables that you can actually eat in space, and we don't understand why not. It's current thinking is maybe, um, it's unlikely to be gravity, magnetic fields, but probably not because we're going around the Earth and it's changing. And, uh, it's probably the chemical nature of the atmosphere around the leaves, possibly. Flowers, not quite sure what's going on there. Maybe there's just a bit too much carbon dioxide. Maybe we're not cleaning the air with amines, something like that. So there's something that's toxic to the plants that we haven't worked out. So oh. that's the net, yeah, so there's a lot of work going on with that. So. Unless we can have constant resupply missions to Mars, which we won't be able to get until we can go much faster, and we're not going to have new methods of propulsion in the next 30 years, so we do need to get this, um, this business of growing food in space. Which your work obviously plays a part in yeah, as well. A little so. minor part, yes. <laughs> Still there. What do you think kind of the idea of extraterrestrials? Do you think? Oh, wow. Ever? Well, there has to be some somewhere, isn't yes. there? Um, yeah, it's just um, without knowing how many millions of stars there are out there, but yes, um, in that, that universe there must mm. be some other life form. Um, but of course, I have to turn the question around on, on little kids. I say, so what does an alien look like? And I say, oh, they've definitely got three heads and they're definitely green and they've got these sort of got arms coming out at various angles. I say, well, maybe, maybe you know, you, we look right through them. Maybe to us they're totally invisible. So maybe they were there all around the outside of the spacecraft. Somehow, I don't ever feel as though anything was there or tried to communicate, but how would I know? Someone once said to me, maybe aliens have found that we live here, but we're too primitive for them, so they don't <laughs> yes. bother making contact. <laughs> Is there anything, kind of any little stories or anything interesting you'd like oh, to Oh, wow, add? wow, never been asked that one before, that's a good one. <laughs> um, so what, what um, I think just the, the thing, you, about all astronauts is that what, we, what we find interesting is what we don't miss, if you like. So we're away from Earth, um, and I understand now at the International Space Station, Tim Peake says it's a bit like being on a four or five star hotel um, compared with the previous sort of family camping trip type of experience that I had um, uh, many years ago. So you have all the luxuries that you want. And even when I was up in space, I had got my warmth, you know, the shelter around us, got food, you've got water. Um, but what we miss are it's that, that variety of people. It's that, you know, the, when you think about all the individuals that you normally have in, have got a con in contact with, you know, most days you meet hundreds of people. And it's that bombardment by society of the adverts, of, of the noises around you, the smells as you walk down the street, and you're constantly taking these things in. And we're being, if you like, sort of um, assaulted by all of this information. But actually, it's quite good for us. It's, it keeps us alive. It keeps us sort of part of society. And when you're away from that, you miss your family, you miss your friends. Um, it's that um, growing up, so you can imagine parents missing the growing up of their children, friendships that you know, may be a bit strained and then have to, you have to re redevelop when you come back. So 
I think it makes us realise how important individual people are in the end. Um, so we have with us Dr. Helen Sharman. Um, oh, not doctor. Doctor? Oh, you're no, not doctor. No, no, no. Oh, I saw Peter is wrong. And went off to do my training. And so, oh, so you're not. Wiki, Wiki, is always wrong. Oh, gosh, I should know this from my science <laughs> degree. <laughs> no, no, no. no.